Oh, are we ready? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel, and I'll be talking about Cascade, which is a new high-level language for implementing SE Linux policy. Um, so, as just said, my name is Daniel. I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft. I've been there since COVID has, and um, there's my email address. I'll also, I think, have my email address on the last slide, but um, my slides are up on the schedule site too, so if you want to grab my email address. Um, there's the uh, GitHub page for the Cascade repository, and also this is a Rust project, so it's available on crates.io. Um, I just made a new release last night, so the, the current state of the code as of this presentation is up on crates.io um, if you want to download it and play with it. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is I'm going to start with the motivations and goals behind why we made a high-level language for SE Linux and what we're trying to achieve with it. And then I'm going to talk about the language itself in terms of what it looks like, how to use it. Uh, it's going to be more of a quick overview than a thorough teach yourself. We don't have enough time for the, the really in-depth nitty-gritty, but I'll refer you to the documentation if you want to learn more. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of future plans, daydreams, where we'd like to go with this. So um, anyone who's interacted with SE Linux has probably heard the complaint that SE Linux is hard. comes up a lot. A lot of the perceived challenge of SE Linux has to do with the fact that systems are complicated. Uh, I regularly get people being like, oh my gosh, SE Linux is so confusing. What's it doing? Like, I don't understand. My code's not doing this. SE Linux is reporting a denial. Clearly, it's a bug in SE Linux. And then it turns out that they're calling some library that's doing something they didn't expect that actually has real security consequences. And they go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that library was doing it. And so in order to write good SE Linux policy, you really have a lot of different things you need to understand. You need to understand the details of how the application you're writing policy for works. You need to understand a lot of the implementation details of the underlying library, of the underlying kernel and system that this is built on top of. You need to understand language details, both of the language that the application is written in in a lot of cases, as well as the language that you're writing the SC Linux policy in. And of course, you need to understand the security goals of your system. And so this is something that in most contexts, I think one person does not have all this knowledge at least easily. And abstractions can help. We can abstract away some of these language details and these kernel details. But in my opinion, the current state of SC Linux is that the discovery and usability of the available abstractions is not where it needs to be. So when we write policy, we have a number of challenges. Um, and I'm going to, for most of this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on writing your M4 macro reference policy style of policy writing, because I think that's what most people are using today, as in terms of how I contrast to Cascade. So if you're writing in reference policy, you have at least four different syntaxes to learn by my count. You've got your, like, your base policy language. You've got your M4 macros on top. If you want to add a fifth, you can say that it's the specific ref policy usage of the M4 macros, the way they've defined interfaces and templates, et cetera. You've got the file context file has its own special syntax. And the constraints was the fourth one I was counting, has its own syntax. Um, because reference policy is architected with a preprocessor first, and then we compiled the base policy language into SIL, and then we compiled the SIL, and there wasn't a lot of checking earlier, so the SIL could still have errors in it. Um, we get these error messages that you're like, I wrote a macro, I'm getting an error in SIL, what's going on? Um, there's not a lot of checking against policy developer error, and traceability from, hey, I have this AVC denial, or I have this uh, result from my static analysis tool on my binary policy, tracing that back up to a line of source code is extremely difficult. So what we'd like to do is focus our time and development effort on our system functional behavior and security goals. Those are the hard parts, those are the interesting parts, and not be focusing our time on language limitations. So we want to build on top of some prior work, um, specifically a project called SIL, Common Intermediate Language. And this is a quote from the SIL wiki here. The SE Linux Common Intermediate Language is designed to be a language that sits between one or more high-level policy languages, such as the current module language, and the low-level kernel policy representation. Um, I think it's you know, an interesting claim to say that the current module language is a high-level language in many senses, but it is. Um, and so SIL is designed exactly for our use case. We want to take a high-level language with advanced features, compile it into SIL, 
and then let SIL handle the low-level details for us. And so my understanding from having talked to some of the people who originally implemented SIL is that they envisioned a future with a whole bunch of different high-level languages that everyone could go write their own high-level language, compile into SIL, we'd have a robust ecosystem. And so far, that has not necessarily materialized yet, but we're hoping to change that. Um, so, and let me, another note on SIL is, as I said a moment ago, I, generally speaking, when I say, you know, Cascade adds this, I mean in comparison to reference policy. Um, SIL has a number of the functionalities here available in native SIL already. Um, so, uh, so our, our model that we're using as we develop policy at Microsoft is that we have a relatively small number of, quote, policy experts um, who kind of handle some of the core uh, functionality of the system. We create abstractions, uh, build things that other people can use. We verify the security goals of the policy. We review the policy that comes in. We run static analysis tools. We enhance static analysis tools. We also have a lot of application developers who are writing various applications, and they, we would like them, at least, to write some of the policy for their applications because they know what their application does. And so they should use the abstractions created by the policy effort, um, developers and need minimal to no policy knowledge. This is the model we're working to get to, and it's had some challenges in terms of the existing language. But that's what we're targeting with Cascade, and I think it's a model that's kind of extensible to a lot of people's use cases. So our goals with Cascade, the number one goal is we want to improve the usability of writing policy. And specifically, we want to have a very consistent syntax. We want to have a pattern where the simple option is typically the best option. In existing reference policy, your simple option is to write an allow rule. And that is very, very rarely the thing you actually want to do to solve your problems. We want to make the things that you actually want to do look very simple. We want to support mapping our information all the way down from what we get at the end of the binary level up to where that came in source. And where possible, we'd like to abstract away implementation details. That always gets tricky when you start talking to security people and they say, oh, but my security goal really cares about this particular detail. And so there's some of that becomes create the ability for those policy experts to abstract away the implementation details as they desire and move some of that into policy. In some cases, it is abstract away implementation details. For example, um, the object classes, some of these object classes have overflowed their number of permissions past 32, so we've got capability to process to, et cetera. Cascade just has capability, and it knows which permissions are capability to and handles that mapping for you, for example. Um, so we'd like to provide support for a model where our application developers are actually writing policy, and that works easy for them, and they say, oh, hey, this is not as bad as I thought. Why does SE Linux have this representation? Rep uh, rep, uh, yeah, what's the word? Reputation, Reputation thank you. Um, okay, and we'd like to also, though, provide full expressiveness for high assurance. Just because we're a high-level language doesn't mean that we want to abstract things away so much that you're not actually having control of your security goals. So think Rust as opposed to, like, Python. Um, and so we want to also be, not by, a foundation on which to build additional high-level tooling. So this is supposed to be a building block not the end-all be-all, and we have some ideas about what that high-level tooling will look like. Um, we also would like to check as much as possible at compile time. Obviously, you can't turn every single runtime error into a compile error. It would be really nice if we lived in a world where that was possible, but um, there's a lot of things that in our current ecosystem, both with ref policy and SIL, you can write policy that is correct, compiles, installs, and is just never what you would have wanted on any system. And we're trying to check as much of that as possible, as well as providing the ability to add checks in a more featureful way that exists now. And so ultimately, we want to be a high-level language. We want to abstract patterns. We want to provide syntactic sugar. We want to do what we can to handhold and make things easy. Um, so in terms of the external tooling, our core language is built as a library. The last talk, I think, teed me up really well, highlighting how Clang's building as a library enabled him to plug in and do all sorts of interesting things. And that's exactly what we're trying to do, kind of emulating Clang there, that almost all of the Cascade implementation is in a library. We've got this really thin front end to provide a binary compiler. And then we could, we or others, could write additional front ends to do things like integrate with IDEs, create analysis tools, um, we talked some about automated incident response tools, a bunch of stuff. Now, obviously, um, Cascade being a Rust project, at the moment, that means those tools would need to be written in Rust, which is certainly a deal breaker for like 
existing IDEs that would like a plugin written in C. So we'll need to add FFI bindings for C. Um, that's coming soon. That'll be, that'll be the, the uh, tagline for this talk in a lot of ways. Um, but so we want to make the, all of the, uh, Cascade has the ability to represent kind of intent and meaning in the policy directly in the policy and documentation in terms of documentation comments and then make all that available to the tools so that you can take advantage of the richness of Cascade and whatever tooling you're doing. So far we're focusing just on type enforcement for now. Um, we do want to support all of the security models of SE Linux. So currently when Cascade writes a policy it generates uh, two roles, system R and object R, one user, and it handles all that for you. It does not build MLS enabled policy. Uh, that's coming, but not in the near term. We gotta get type enforcement working better first. Um, we've got a growing, fairly robust test suite at now. We wanna make sure that future compiler um, enhancements are safe, regression free, easy to do. Um, these test suites also provide simple functional examples. If you want to look at, here's some working and some non-working Cascade policy, uh, that's a, a decent set of examples to start with. And this is, the path there is in the Cascade repository. In the data directory, we've got, um, hopefully the names policies and air policies are intuitive. Okay, current status. So as of yesterday, I released uh, version 0.0.2. .0 That's basically just a line in the sand of this is where the project was as of the time of this presentation. Um, if you wanna see exactly the details of that, there's a change log in the repository. Um, and we've got support for declaring types, uh, AV rules, except never allow is not implemented yet. Um, and we have inheritance. We have a thing called resource association. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we've got a number of the abstractions and features that you would desire if you're going to implement, say, a full policy. Um, many of those are done. Many of them are, those are in progress. Um, and we're still working on some of the, the nitty gritty low level details of stuff that you have to have. But like, you know, port labeling, for example, not currently supported in Cascade needs to get there. We'll get there in a few months. Um, so we're going to hopefully in a month or two here release 0 0.1, which will give you a clean build of a sufficiently complex kind of comprehensive policy. And then the goal later this year is going to be, we're going to call it 1.0 for, um, a sufficiently comprehensive support for, Hey, I've written something that's, you know, roughly functionally equivalent to say targeted policy or any existing policy. It's not necessarily as fully featured full, but it's kind of done enough that I would say, hey, go ahead and start using it, write your policies in it. So that's coming. Um, at that point is when I would aim to make any kind of backwards compatibility pro promises about, hey, you write policy that compiles now, I intend to compile it for all time or at least until 2.0. Um, and so right now, you know, if you, if you write policy, I do reserve the right at this point to change how the language works and break it. Um, I actually have a pull request open right now that does that. So. Um, we're, we're changing things. I mean, it's, it's stable-ish, but reserve the right to change things. And if you want to see, you know, the, the nitty gritty details of all that, I've got a roadmap.md file in the Cascade repository that kind of walks through all of our future plans up to 1.0, past it to 1.1 and 2 and 3 and things that are in the, the pipeline down the road. So, and we're very open to modifying that. That's not, this is the dictated plan we must follow. So if there's something that you say, hey, I would love to adopt Cascade, I need feature X, let me know, and we can modify it. So let's go into the details of how the policy language works. So a general rule that I think is an absolute is uh, declarations are blocks with curly braces and rules are statements that end in semicolons. So we declare types with either the domain or resource keyword. That definitely should have had quotes around domain and quotes around resource. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting thing that's, I think, different from existing precedent that we've put in the language the fact that some of these types refer to processes and some of these refer to resources, which maybe is a controversial decision. I think it's a feature, not a bug, that types are types are types in SE Linux and they're all types. But this really allows us to do some things at the compiler level to make various assumptions about how people are using these things and add additional compile time checking and functionality. Um, so we also declare functions with the function keyword, um, and we'll talk about functions in a moment. So here's an example to declare a domain called foo. This is a type named foo. It's just a type that I'm promising to use as a process, 
and I can only use as a process. The language will enforce that for me. Um, and it's got a function in it. And then we can call it down at the bottom. You can see, you know, in domain bar, we're calling foo dot some function. Probably, you know, in most cases, you'd be calling functions on resources is more of your common, but maybe some function is signaling or IPC or whatever. And then obviously you've got various rules in the function. The domains can also have rules, maybe calls to other domains or built-ins like allow, etc. So functions, um, functions do support full type checking on their arguments. That includes the SC Linux types. So if you want to create a type, or it's, it would technically be an attribute under the hood, but in Cascade, that's now a virtual domain or a virtual resource. Um, if you want to create a virtual resource that's you know some abstraction for say temp files, and then you want to say this function only takes temp files, then it can take any kind of temp file, and you'll get that enforced at compile time. These functions are all automatically derivable via inheritance. Um, that means that we can define kind of a high-level interface that you know all all domains or all all files, for example, are required to support you know a read function, etc. And that way, we can kind of predictably go in and say, if I know that this is a file type, I can call read on it. I know it'll work. And we also don't have boilerplate. We've done a, a couple of kind of ad hoc studies of looking at like if we take this ref policy module and re-implement it in Cascade, how much does the number of lines of code go down? And the big win there is there were 300 lines of interfaces that become essentially zero lines because those interfaces all got derived from a parent type. Um, and then going forward, we really want to uh, have automated documentation generation on these functions. Um, that's it's something that's in progress and integrate with external tooling in all sorts of interesting ways. So this is what this is a built-in function, actually, uh, the allow function here. It takes four arguments. So you'll note this is one of those uses of the domain and resource separation um, here. Because I mean, I've made the mistake before writing SE Linux policy where I accidentally you know, say a foo t instead of foo exec t on my target. And then everything compiles. I get the rule on my system and didn't do what I want to do. Um, obviously, astute viewers will notice that some allow rules can take a resource as their source. Um, and so that's a, an asterisk on that, that we've got to handle that some other way. The details are TBD, but we'll figure out something there. There's a couple of good options. Um, the, uh, the square brackets around perm here are uh, a list. So the, the permissions in this case are a list of permissions. At some point, I'd like to add um, some syntactic sugar support for uh, letting you do lists on all of these things. But at least in the first cut for now, it's just the permissions are a list. Everything else is single. So for now, you have to write multiple allow rules if you need, say, multiple object classes. Um, obviously, you could write a native, native cascade wrapper function that would allow that. Um, and we'll, we'll add some extra sugar at some point. Um, so yeah. And uh, then the, the curly brackets at the end, obviously, would be the contents of this function. In the allow case, this is a built-in function. So it doesn't have any cascade contents. It compiles directly down to a sill allow rule. Um, annotations. So cascade supports all of the things we've talked about so far, all the declarations and the statements. Everything can be annotated. Um, so what is an annotation? An annotation provides additional metadata about various items that can be used by tooling. And by tooling, I do mean very generally and broadly. Now, obviously, right now, the only tooling that exists is the compiler. But in the long term, we would like to have you know, various cascade-aware pieces of tooling. Maybe some of the current tooling can be expanded to be cascade-aware. In some cases, I think we'll write new tooling. Um, and anytime we want to have some piece of tooling understand something about Cascade, we can pass that through in an annotation. Um, so, so far we've implemented uh, four annotations. Um, the associate and associated call I'll talk about in a little bit. Alias is the way in Cascade to provide type aliases, just a different name for um, something. We also have aliasable functions, which I don't think exist in uh, anything currently, so you can provide a new name for a function. This is cool for like if you want to refer to directory reads as either read or list, because both terms have been around. You implement one function, you alias it to list. 
Um, make list controls the ability to coerce things into lists. So by default, kind of under the hood for you, permissions are uh, declared with make list. So that if when you pass, if you want to say allow something, 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 read, it'll coerce that into a list for you. Um, this is kind of one of those compile checking things that we want to say we want to do list coercion to be nice, but we don't want to like do it without you kind of opting in because it's a security language. We would like to be very predictable. So if you intended to pass a list, and you can put this on anything, and it will get automatically convert, coerced into a list if it's used in a list context. Um, we've also got some planned ones. I'm actually glad to see I put derive in planned. I thought I'd put it in currently implemented, um, but I don't actually have a pull request open for it yet. It's work in progress. I was working on it on the plane on the way over here, and it's almost done. Um, derive is the ability to automatically derive your, apparent, your parent functions. It takes a couple of arguments, one argument, is uh, a list of which parent functions you would like to derive, including an option for all if you just want to derive every function your parent has, which I think would be the normal thing to use. But if you want to say, I just want to de derive read and write, or I want to manually list every function, that's up to you. The second argument is a strategy argument. And so that's a, um, you guys may be familiar with the diamond problem and multiple inheritance. Um, so the diamond problem is just if I'm a child class, I've got two parents, and they both provide different implementations of, say, a read function, then how do I know which implementation to use? And in traditional programming languages, this is a very hard problem. Um, we have one huge advantage here in that SE Linux is broadly not order dependent. And so just do both is a really reasonable option because it doesn't matter what order we do both in, which is why that would normally be a problem. So one of the derived strategies available is the union strategy where you just union together the permissions in every parent function. And then you also have the option to specify a particular parent name that if there's a naming conflict, give me these parents functions. Um, if there's some other strategy, you're writing Cascade and you're like, oh, I want another strategy, let me know. Happy to implement more strategies there. Um, hint and ignore. Um, so hint is um, something I think is going to be really cool, but it's very much vaporware at this point. And the idea is that we can provide hinting about things that will be used by analysis tooling. When you get an ABC denial, it can pop up this hint that says, hey, this is access on, say, a temp file. You probably wanted to create your own new derived temp file uh, that's a, you know, your specific type temp file. You probably didn't want to access temp directly. And you can use these things for like, you know, hey, this, we think this permission, if you encountered this kind of denial, that's probably an attack. Like this really shouldn't happen. Um, I'd like to have hint support kind of machine readable and human readable things so that you could then plug that into some kind of incident response thing. Um, we'll see. I, we need to flesh out the details of what hint's going to look like. The other one that we've talked about a lot is ignore, um, which once we add compiler warning support, which is also not there yet, then ignore will be the way to ignore a compiler warning. OK. Um, so resource association. So it's a very common pattern where policies have some domain, say IP tables T, and it's got various resource files that are used by it. IP tables temp T, IP tables conf T, IP tables exec T, et cetera. Um, in your M4 based policies, you'd have to do a whole it's template set up, it's complicated, it's confusing if you want to like automate this. And so most people don't. They just kind of manually do this every time, at least in my experience. In SIL, you can set this up via um, block inheritance. Uh, that's lacking syntactic sugar. And um, I think for you know someone coming into it going, oh my gosh, what's this SIL block inheritance context concept? It's a little kind of confusing. So this is kind of a core feature in Cascade that I think is going to be more usable for people. Um, this is what it looks like. So I gave the temp file example here. You create a virtual resource. A virtual resource is just a resource or a domain. You can have a virtual domain that does not result in a specific type instantiation on the system. Under the hood, it becomes an attribute. Um, and so we have this virtual resource temp. It's got a associated call, which is in this case the manage call, because that's what you typically want to do. And the associated call, every time we associate a resource with the virtual, or associate a domain with that resource, rather, then we're going to call that on our new derived resource. So when we associate temp with uh, my app, it's going to create a resource, an actual real resource, not a virtual one, named myapp.temp. And then it's going to call myapp.temp.manage for you for free. And so this is basically we say we've got this idea of temp files. We want to be able to create new temp files. And when you create your own new temp file, you want to be able to manage it, whatever that means. 
Um, you can define that. Um, yeah, and so this associate, you know, this takes a list, so you can associate multiple different things. Yeah. So here's an example of what that looks like uh, compared to reference policy. So this is a pretty common pattern. You'll see I've got, you know, my app, I give it the domain type attribute. Uh, then I declare various resource files associated with it, like my app temp t, um, give those the temp attribute, etc. Um, and then I give out these permissions. In the case of a temp file, it's typically, you know, managing files, stores, and symlinks. You probably need to know, like, how I intend to use it, right? In a comp file, it's going to be reading, etc. And then you've got your rules. So in Cascade, we've declared temp other elsewhere. We've stored the knowledge that what we do is manage temp files in the general temp file declaration, so we don't need to repeat it every time. And so all we do is associate, um, that's actually wrong. That should have said associate temp is what that should have said, and then it would create the myapt.temp. So sorry, typo on the slides. And then we put our rules in there. So it gets a lot shorter. Um, a lot of the redundant stuff is kind of carried up to uh, generic implementations. All right, inheritance. So um, we inherit using the inherits keyword, and this creates a actual type that is associated with the attribute that is the parent. So in this case, we've got IP tables temp t that is a child of temp file. So again, typically I would say you maybe use you should create IP tables temp t via association. But if you wanted to manually create it via inheritance, you could do it this way. Um, yeah. So let's see. Um, inheritance has a number of effects. So all of the rules from the parent get applied to the child. Everything uh, rules to the parent get supplied through attributes. Um, and the functions, the parent functions are required to be implemented, right? So this is a known interface that people can then rely on as they're writing other policy. And if you would like to write those yourself, you are free to do so. If you say, I don't really want exactly what my parent uh, function looks like, great. And you can derive them automatically, which I think will be the common case. Um, if your parent has associated resources, you get your own associated resources that are used there. So you can create like a a generic like application domain that associates various you know temp comp files that everyone needs and then your specific application doesn't even need to worry about the association it just gets a temp file um, and then we we call associated calls um, on those copies of our associated resources uh, just like you would with any kind of association so um I was told in a someone that was looking over these slides that that was the difference was confusing so I'm trying to Clarify the difference here. So inheritance is creating a hierarchy of types. Um, this domain is a more specific form of this domain. So you know, IP tables is a more specific sort of application. Resource association creates a relationship between domains and resources. This domain owns this resource. By the way, when you're building like modules and stuff and saying, okay, this domain goes in this module, all of its resources travel with the domain for free. So I don't need to like enumerate all of the different things associated with the IP tables domain that goes in the IP tables module. That just comes along for free. Um, and associations are carried through inheritance. Okay, conditionals. Um, you guys may be familiar with this XKCD cartoon. Um, this could probably apply to most cascade terminology decisions that these terms are all kind of interesting. Um, and now I'm like, oh, I'm gonna solve it all and now we've got new usages of the terms. Um, SE Linux conditional terminology is kind of confusing because of historical reasons and there's, there's booleans and there's tunables and tunables mean something a little bit different depending on if you're in SIL or if you're in reference policy. Um, there's uh, reference policy compile time macros. I was going to like get a whole confusing chart of like here's how everything does and I was like I'm just going to make mistakes. Um, so it's complicated. So in Cascade we've got one kind of conditional and we're calling that a boolean just to add to the complication of everything because now boolean means something else in Cascade than it does in actual SE Linux world. Um, Cascade booleans are either runtime settable or compile time settable. So that means that if you have a runtime settable Boolean, that is an actual SE Linux Boolean that gets passed through into your source. And if you have a compile time settable Boolean, then that gets compiled out. You can mix and match those Booleans freely and the compiler will handle that for you and take out the compile time ones from the final policy. 
Um, if you're following along in the slides I uploaded, sorry, the slide's not there. I edited it this morning, so that's why you're confused. Um, okay, flexible build system. Um, shout out to Angelina, who's a summer intern on our team this year, who's currently working on this. Um, and so this is, this is work in progress, as is the conditionals on the last slide. Um, if you download the latest and greatest cascade, you're going to go, ah, conditionals don't work. Um, actually, you may not notice, because they silently don't work, which is the best kind of not working. Um, <laughs> so uh, build multiple, yeah, so we want to support a use case where you have multiple systems defined in the same repository with really easy configuration. In reference policy-based systems, you got to add a bunch of gross shell script wrapping around your build system to handle this. We also obviously want to have support for building individual modules, and we want to be able to really handle clean dependency resolution. I know I've struggled a lot with flipping stuff in modules.conf and ref policy and seeing things break and fighting with it for days, and it's pretty painful. So hopefully we can improve that. Um, I'd like to improve optional policy support. This is something I've chatted with a few people in the community about a few times. I've got a slide on that later. Um, so anyway, so we we're going to have a pretty flexible build system, lets you say, I've got various systems. This is what they contain. I can build all of them at once. I can build just one. And Cascade will kind of handle all that for you nicely under the hood. Uh, one thing we want to really focus in on is helpful error handling. So um, currently, our focus has really been biased towards making sure that if you've written valid Cascade policy, it compiles correctly. And so the errors are definitely a work in progress. Um, and I was looking at, you know, setting up a demo and generating some errors, and I, like, generated an error thing. I was like, ooh, that error message is really bad. I don't want to put that up on the screen. So um, it's, some of our errors are really good. I'm going to show you one on the next slide that I'm a little proud of. But um, generally speaking, so far, our errors are a work in progress, but that's a, a really key focus area going forward. And um, I'm, like, putting up all the bad things. Our errors are here. Let me put up. Here's an error in Cascade. Um, so. This is, uh, shows you what file we were in and what line number is on. It points exactly at where the error was. So this is a, a one-line file that says domain foo inherits bar. And when you compile that by itself, it says I don't know what bar is. Um, something I would like to add in the future that we don't have yet is the kind of spell checking stuff where it says, oh, bar, did you mean bra or whatever? Because um, you have a type named that. But in this case, it says, hey, bar is not a valid type. Um, gives you an, a thing at the top. Um, so, going back to the last slide, one of the things that I really want to add is the ability to point at multiple code points. I was just writing uh, the error message yesterday for if you have a duplicate declaration, I try to declare a function named foo, and there's already a function named foo. Um, and then I was like, well, I can only point at one code point, and that's kind of worthless to be like, this is a duplicate, and you're like, of what? So, that's coming very soon, um, but not there yet. Um, but so, generally speaking, uh, we're, our, our Error messages are inspired by Rust error messages. If you have written Rust code, you'll notice this looks basically just like a Rust error message. Um, there's a library that gives us all this, which is awesome. And yeah, so hopefully these guys are going to be really helpful, and they support all these kind of hints that say, you know, this is what your problem is, this is how you should fix it, hand holds you a lot more. Um, the other thing is uh, definitely a philosophical approach is that if the SIL doesn't compile that we generate, that's a cascade bug. So reference policy will often spit out non-compiling SIL, and then you get all these gross SIL warnings. And so, yeah, our goal is to say we should, theoretically, if we're bug-free, we should never compile non-compiling SIL code. Obviously, we'll fail at that at times, but that's what we're shooting for. Um, Cross-language interaction. So SIL gives us a lot of this for free. Um, and basically, if you, um, you want to call into Cascade stuff from another language, say maybe a hypothetical not yet existing high level language or existing ref policy or whatever, we try to pass down as much of our information as we possibly can into SIL so that you can call in via SIL. Um, there's a couple of caveats and gotchas in there we can talk about offline if you want to do that. Uh, we do need to add additional support in Cascade, which we haven't done yet, but intend to for calling into, say, reference policy interfaces or SIL macros that are defined elsewhere outside of Cascade, like an extern statement or something like that, that is on the to-do list. So let me jump over and do a really brief demo. And wow, I cannot see this at all. 
So um, I'm in my cascade directory. I'm going to go into data policies, and these are our test policies so far. I'm going to run cast C. Is this big enough? Can you guys see it? Can you make it? Okay, I'm seeing nods. Cool. I don't know there's a lot I can do about that, unfortunately. Okay, cool. Um, here's, here's a brightness button. I don't know if that's going to help at all. Okay. Um, so, um, cast C, you got a nice help string, tells you there's not a ton of options so far. Uh, we're working on that. But it generates by default out.sil as its generated file. Um, and let's compile something and show you what it looks like. So, I just compiled, this is associate.cast. Um, which is one of our test files. It tests the resource association feature. It's got a bunch of cascade policy in here. Um, and then when I ran the cast C, we generated this out.sil file. So where are we in the file? If you'll notice at the top, um, I didn't write anything about object classes and permissions. Cascade did our full kernel set of object classes and permissions at the top. There's a bunch of stuff that's required to have a compliant policy that Cascade kind of put in all this boilerplate for you. You get down to the bottom, and I wouldn't expect users to generally look at this um, too much, but we got uh, domain and resource here, and then we start actually saying these are the things that we actually declared in our policy, and this is the SIL compilation of the policy that we wrote. Um, it's not necessarily very structured SIL, but it's also generated, so it's not really intended to be human readable. Um, it's intended to be easy for a compiler to generate. Um, oh, so the other thing I was going to show while we're in here, uh, I think, let me show you an error. Let me show you an error message, I think is the other thing I want to do. Um, I was going to do some other stuff, but I think we're short on time. Um, so I was going to do this one, and you can see this is what error messages look like. So in this case, we said that um, foo inherited, I can't read this at all, it's not bright, Okay, so foo inherited foo parent, but it was required to implement foo func as a result of inheriting foo parent, and it didn't do that. Um, and you can see what the, the cascade here that generated this error looked like. So in this case, foo parent defines some function named foo func, and foo inherited it and did not derive or override foo func. And so the users of foo would expect, because this is a well defined interface, that foo would inherit, would have a foo func function, and so we get a compiler error that tells us, hey, we didn't do that. Okay, so that's the end of my very brief, brief demo for the sake of having a demo. Um, if you would like to try it yourself, you can uh, download the GitHub repo also and build from source. That's really easy, just cargo build. You can also get it off of crates.io. So if you have cargo installed, you can run cargo install se Linux cascade. The name cascade was already taken. Um, then you run cast C, you give it your list of source files. Um, and then I didn't show, I guess, let me jump back to the demo really quick. Um, once we've built this out.sil file, um, we can then compile it with sesil C. I do hope that at some point Cascade will just do this for you under the hood. Um, but right now you've got to run that manually. So you can see we got that policy.32 file there which is um, obviously my SE sil C is a little bit older. It's not generating policy.33 yet, but um, we generated our full system policy. We could install that on a system and then watch our system very much not boot because this policy is not really defining what we need to have our system. It probably would boot in permissive mode, actually, but I'd, we'd certainly not built boot in enforcing mode. We'd have to relabel, and we don't have any file context statements in our policy, so that would be kind of fun. Um, where's my slides? Okay. So, um, yeah, try it out yourself and have fun. All right, so I got about five minutes left. So I'm going to try to blaze through these future plans pretty quick, try to leave a moment for questions at the end. So this is kind of where we would like to go. Um, so one thing we, I would really like to add in is better file context support. So file context take regexes and types to associate with those regexes and a little bit of other stuff, but that's the, the bulk of it. And the thing is these regexes represent paths. So if we actually treat them as paths that embed regexes, that can let us evaluate our runtime logic a little bit better and say, hey, you know, 
this, this regex can never be applied because there's another path with a more specific regex or, you know, this isn't a possibly a real path. Like there's no path here that evaluates this way. Um, I would love to, I mean, we use a kind of very small subset of regex patterns for most of our paths. Obviously, I think we want to keep full regex expressiveness for those times when we need it. But stuff like dot star that we use all the time, we can maybe just make that some kind of generic. Um, so I think that can become more usable. Um, and also, oh yeah, compile time expansions of, so things like, what's a good example here? Um, if we want to say that we, we want to have something apply to like specifically just files and directories, but not symlinks. In the current policy languages, we have to write two different file context statements for that. So I think it'd be very reasonable to like take a list for of what object classes you want this to apply to, and then expand at compile time into multiple file contexts to get some more flexible support. Um, optional policy. I have complained about optional policy quite a bit lately. So optional policy is a functionality that's supposed to say if I have a some kind of type that it definitely needs certain access and there's other access that if certain policy is present, I should have access to that policy. If it's not present, that's okay, don't break. Um, the problem is that's a wonderful intent, but in my experience, what actually happens when policy developers write this is this is a way to make the compiler happy. And so our code doesn't end up reflecting what our tool actually needs to have versus optionally can have. It ends up reflecting the particular environment, how my compiler was set up when I happened to compile it, which makes our policy a lot less portable and a lot harder to change things if my actual policy situation changes. And now I took out some module that should have been optional and things are breaking because those things weren't marked optional. Um, so one suggestion, and this was suggested to me by someone in the community, and sadly I've forgotten who it was, so I apologize to you, whoever you are. Um, one suggestion is to say that all of our rules by default would be optional, but we can opt in with maybe an annotation for what's required. So you can see annotation up there. Then we have this apache.conf.read that would just be optional. If Apache goes away, that's fine. The rule goes away. But then one use case that we really do want to have is have a block of rules that are optional together. And so in this case, we've got this hypothetical example that if squid, which is a proxy, is present on this system, I want to call this squid dbus chat function, and I also need sysadmin for whatever reason, right? Because squid's present, I use the sysadmin capability. So if we just have every line be optional by default, then suddenly sysadmin is something I have unconditionally when I'd really rather not have it if squid's not present. I know I need it in that particular case, but I don't want to have it because it's really privileged, obviously. Um, and so have the ability to have a block that says these things need to be optional together. Um, in this example here, I've written in like an explicit like optional based on the presence of squid rather than existing languages, I think, infer optional based on what's in the block. I think the explicit might be clearer. So this is an idea. I have a boff session um, at 4 p.m. and this is one of the key things I would like to discuss at that. Um, I am really low on time, so I'm gonna keep trying to move. Okay, so integrations with other security mechanisms is something we've talked about. Um, our focus for now and for the next six months to a year is definitely SE Linux first and foremost is our primary thing. But at the end of the day, We've built up this security model to describe our system, and there's no reason we couldn't supplement it to output other security mechanisms. So I have a hypothetical example of what an IP tables thing might look like, that when I declare this port type in SE Linux, I have a port con rule that associates it with certain ports. Um, that should have done with a semicolon, sorry. I was throwing this slide together last night. And then we maybe annotate it to say, hey, I'd like to generate an IP tables rule. And then in addition to my SIL output, I could have some IP tables rules output along the sides. Um, I had a very brief conversation yesterday with some of the IMA folks about whether we could use this for IMA policy. I don't know. Could we use this for set comp policy? Probably not. I'm not sure. Um, so, but this would be really, I think, an interesting area to explore going forward. Um, delete. So we've always, for since before I was involved in SE Linux, people have talked about delete as something that I want to be able to delete rules. I'm not going to go into all the complexities, and it gets weird and complicated, and what do you mean? And there's a user expectation thing about, hey, why do I have a denial for this? I can see the allow rule. I'm looking at the allow rule here, not being aware that that allow rule was deleted elsewhere. There's complexities. Um, 
there's an idea for like a, a local delete that wouldn't need any SIL integration and would work locally in Cascade that might be sufficient for Cascade use case, but I need to dig more into exactly what Cascade's use case is plus what broader people in the community want out of delete. That's something else to maybe discuss in the boff. All right, I do want to land on this. This is my last bit here. Um, audit to Cascade. So there's a tool called Audit to Allow um, that is widely misused and also widely used. And the problem with Audit to Allow and including Audit to Allow R, which generates your reference policy interfaces, is um, that adding allow rules is seldom the right answer. Um, now, right is very context dependent. It might, your mileage may vary. Um, but often you want to change code. You want to fix labeling issues. Um, a lot of times you want to rerun in permissive mode. If your denial says permissive equals one, it was the first thing that blocked, and you're probably just going to add this allow rule and rerun it. Um, sometimes you want to don't audit these things. Um, we've been noticing a lot in our environment, systemd really wants to claim it needs capnet admin, and it normally does not need capnet admin. Um, and that would be a good hint thing, right? To say, hint, you don't actually need capnet admin, probably, right? Um, maybe you want to worry about an attack, right? If you get in this pattern of every time I see a denial, I'm going to blindly allow audit to allow and deny it. Well, there's your path for the attacker to get past your SE Linux policy. Just wait a little bit after for you to allow their attack pattern. Um, and so what I would love to do is um, audit to cascade is to say we've got all this, a lot of information about policy intent. We've got uh, documentation comments eventually. And so we'd like to make a kind of pluggable heuristics engine that looks at ABC denials and gives it a little bit more thought in a machine sense, right? It follows some kind of heuristics to guess which of those previous things is most likely to be the thing based on your specific denial. Um, this would require probably passing a lot of our policy information through as some sort of debug symbols that would end up landing on your target system, whether that gets in, in SIL in the policy binary, et cetera, or whether that lives as a separate file, we'd have to figure out. Um, expose all of our Cascade documentation directly in Audit to Cascade. And so then what you can get is, hey, I'm a developer. I know nothing about SE Linux. Let me run Audit to Cascade. And you get a whole write-up about, OK, I got this denial. Here's what's going on. Let me tell you what each of these types are in human-readable terms. And let me tell you, here's five different ways you could fix it in order of preference. And if you want to just say, I want kind of existing Audit to allow behavior, just give me something like that, You know, give it a mode for that that would use cascade functions. So that's, that's I think, the number one place that I'm interested in going with cascade is to be able to kind of add that sort of support. I think the base policy language is the platform on which to build that. And because the base policy language is built as a library, this tool actually can just live on top of that library, directly parse your cascade policy, and it'll be relatively much easier to write as a result. So if you want more info, here's my email address again. Here's the Cascade GitHub. Um, I would highly recommend if you're looking to learn more about it, there's a readme in the Cascade GitHub. The uh, change log will give you, and the roadmap gives you like the really nitty gritty details of what that I just said we do, we actually do, and what we just said we do, I have a pull request open for. Um, and we've got a docs directory that goes into more detail on how you use the language. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm two minutes over. Any questions in your negative two minutes? Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. The question was, um, you know, we've, we've got a lot of policy already. Um, is there a plan for migration? Um, and interoperability with existing policy. So I, I did talk briefly about interoperability. I very much want to add some kind of like extern support for Cascade so that you can have write Cascade modules to interplug with your existing policy. Um, and that's something that's on the plan and we're going to do in the near term. Um, and then in terms of migration path, um, I've had a few discussions uh, with some people at Microsoft about automated tooling to migrate policies. The, the challenge there is that, you know, with, there's a few places where I kind of, we kind of go, I really would prefer if you write your policy in a much more cascady style rather than kind of blindly migrating it. Um, so specifically what that would look like is unclear. We already have a couple of non-public yet shell scripts or Python scripts or something that does a little bit of automated migration, I think. I haven't worked on that directly. 
Um, but yes, we would like to have automated migration things and um, a, a migration pathway is something we definitely need to have, I think. So I don't have a great answer yet, but I need to. So we're working on it. Hopefully that was helpful. Great. Any other questions in the back? Yep, I have a, a virtual question. Great. What GUI programs are helpful to write SE Linux policies and show dependencies? Sometimes we have some issues with SE Linux policies for Android and edit it in Notepad, which is very painful. And how do you debug SE Linux policies in runtime without audit logs? <laughs> um, those are a couple of big questions. Um, so I guess I don't need to repeat that because that was just said over a mic. Um, so the first question is, what GUI tools do we have? Um, there, a long time ago, was an IDE plugin for Eclipse called Slide. I tried running that on a recent version of Eclipse, and it didn't work. So I think it's pretty unmaintained at this point. Um, other people would probably be better people to ask for me. I'm not aware of any kind of GUI IDE plugins for SE Linux that are actively maintained and used at this point. Um, I, that's something I hope to change with Cascade because we're building Cascade as this library. It should be relatively easy to write a really featureful plugin for an IDE, but that's not something we have yet. So stay tuned in terms of your Cascade policy. Um, I think I'm going to maybe decline to take the debug policy denials without ref lo ref, uh, without audit logs on Android question just because of time and it's not necessarily Cascade related. So sorry, I recommend uh, emailing the SE Linux list for help with those sorts of questions. So sorry, people who will respond to that on the SE Linux list if you didn't want that question. <laughs> All right, um, I think I'm over time. So thank you guys very much for your time.